Despite a great effort, the Braves fall short at March Madness, but we are not done yet. We are joined by a special guest today, that and much more tonight on Braves Talk. All right, everybody, Braves Nation, joined by the OG Rick, and we do have a special guest that we'll bring in here in a moment, but welcome to Braves Talk. As we said at the top, uh, the Braves gave everything they had in the semifinals against the Bulldogs, who end up being the eventual Arch Madness Tournament champions, earning the auto bid to the NCAA Tournament. As you can see, we are absent. The Iceman tonight had some family uh, conflicts he had to tend to, so bear with me. Um, as we go through this, uh, the production might be a little different than you're used to, as you noticed by the intro song. But I'm sure you Bradley fans can appreciate a little swing march. But first, Dad, how you doing tonight and how you feeling about the Braves? I'm doing pretty good and anxious and uh, very hopeful and positive that we will get that all encompassing NIT bid since we can't go to the, the big dance. The little dance is just as good. So, but I'm right, feeling great. Yeah, so we'll definitely get to that as we get moving here. But uh, Bradley fans, I'm sure this gentleman is no stranger to you. You have seen him um, on X, and uh, we have a Bradley alum, Bradley Supervan, Bobby Hack. Bobby, thanks for joining us. How you doing? Good, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Um, obviously, a little disappointed over the past weekend, although it was always fun. The guys were competitive. But, uh, yeah, NIT, NIT, I'll take it uh, from when I was in school. It's, uh, it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) that's one thing I think we uh, we tend to take for granted right now. The the last five or six years have been outstanding to um, as a Bradley fan. And I'm sure that, you know, some people have hopped along the hopped on the bandwagon along the way, which is great. You know, the more the merrier. But to those of us who, you know, kind of suffered through, um, you know, the Geno Ford years, I mean, things got there were some dark days, uh, especially there towards the end. And I've said before on on the show that I started to have my doubts if if Bradley could get back to this point, you know, if the attendance at the game should get back up uh, to where it's been and just the general interest in Peoria. So I'm super pumped to see that it has. And, um, you know, I think a good place to start, too, would be, you know, your kind of your journey as a Bradley fan, how you got um, introduced to Bradley basketball and how your fandom has grown. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um... For sure. I think to start, to kind of start, I'm born and raised in Des Plaines, Illinois, so the Chicagoland area. Um, went to school at Main West High School, so nowhere, I mean, two and a half hours north of Peoria, right? But uh, high school, my counselor kind of turned me on. I'm actually a marketing major, but he turned me on to the sports comm program. So I went down and visited Bradley, fell in love with it, went there, um, enrolled in 2011. So I do remember the Sweet 16 uh, season in 06, um, kind of as a, coming up as a young kid. Uh, watching NCAA March Madness. So that was always kind of in the back of my mind. But, yeah, I literally came in and left with Geno Ford. So (laughs) 2011 to 2015. So uh, it's pretty remarkable that I kind of stuck through it all. I mean, I'm I'm very passionate about sports, big Cubs, Bears, Blackhawks, Bulls fan. And obviously Bradley's my school. So I loved every minute of it. And uh, I told you guys before the show, but fun fact, I was the uh, original Kaboom. Um, I think he debuted in 2013, just kind of being a dumb kid in the student section. The cheer squad was like, uh, all right, hey, do you want to try out for this? And I was like, sure. So that's kind of where it all started. I mean, obviously, when I was there, the basketball team, let's be honest, they were not that good. I think we had one above 500 season my junior year or sophomore year at like 500, maybe 16 and 15 or something like that. And then we had the home game at Renaissance Coliseum against, I want to say Green Bay, uh, if you guys remember that. I think Wardle might have even been coaching, which is nuts. Um, so that's kind of weird. But, 
yeah, from there, I've just been hooked ever since I followed him. And then, you know, once I left coach came in and I was like, all right, well, I can do another rebuild because my f- four years at school were essentially a rebuild. But a couple of moments that stick out over my tenure um, were was when Michigan came to town. Um, right. I mean, that was incredible. I know, I know we lost the game, but we hung tough. I mean, the team of like Walt Lemon Jr., Will E. Golf, um, Jake Eastman, I think, God, these are names all just come I'm popping back into my head. But yeah, it was it was just cool to see. So I could tell that, uh, you know, Peoria really rallied around not just I mean, not just Bradley, I should say, but Peoria is the city really rallied around Bradley as a whole. So I was hooked. I was going to be hooked no matter where I went to college, but I'm, I'm very, very happy and I miss it every day and I would do it all over again. I tell everybody go to Bradley and, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, I think here at Bradley, there's sort of an it's an interesting cross section between um, the community and you know the locals and the student body because I feel like you know obviously you have alumni that remain fans of their teams uh, wherever they go, but I feel like Bradley's the biggest show in Peoria, and I feel like Bradley's ingrained in the fabric of Peoria maybe more so than other universities may be uh, within the town that they reside in, and so I think that. You know, the, the obviously the student interest, just like the local interest, has sort of um, grown and waned with the success of the program. But it was it's super exciting to see more fans at the game, more students at the game, especially because that's what this program needs to keep building our young fans, getting young people at the game. You know, having letting them realize that this is uh, this is quality basketball, so quality Division One basketball that's played at Bradley and played in the Valley. And I thought that that was showcased on Saturday and Sunday at Arch Madness um, in, in every game that was played pretty much. And, you know, that there was ever a doubt that there's big time basketball played here uh, that that should have removed it. And as far as the kaboom fact goes, that that's something, man, that should warrant some Hall of Fame consideration. <laughs> no way. Road. God, I, yeah, so Bobby Parker ever watches this. He's probably just laughing. Um, but, yeah, no, it was it was it. I loved it. It was fun. I actually uh, actually kind of hurt my knee a little bit doing it, but whatever. That's no, no big deal. But uh, um, yeah, it was a good time. I mean, now I'm glad that, you know, I definitely pay attention. I'm pay attention to him, even like watching on TV or going to the games. I come down a couple times a year to try to go to a couple games. Uh, but now it seems like he kind of did a little dip in his uh, performance. But this year he seemed like to be all over with his like they put gym shoes on him, which is a good call. It's running around out there. Uh, Twitter seemed to be a little bit more X seemed to be a little bit more active, but yeah, I had some good times. I actually really quick, fun story uh, as Kaboom. I went, went, if you guys remember Walt Lemon Jr. was in that college dunk contest, yeah. go back. It's on YouTube. I was that, I was Kaboom holding the ball for him and everything. So I went down, flew down to Texas. Uh, I believe it's SMU's campus. So I, I have some great memories as, as Kaboom. And obviously, you know, not just basketball, but all the, all go to all the other sports, baseball, softball, soccer, volleyball, everything. Yeah, and that's exciting. And I think that um, you were right. This year, Kaboom was uh, it was on another level. I thought, and yeah. I'm sure the, the gym shoes probably helped oh. a lot uh, when you got rid of those gargoyle feet. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I was really uh, really impressed with you know the addition of the energy to the environment during game day. Yeah. Yeah, that was very very much needed. Some of that that extra energy like this year, and. Uh, you know, hey, it's really cool stuff to yeah. you know, meet meet the original Kaboom. Yeah, the original <laughs> student, yeah, to do it, yeah, you know, because we didn't have a mascot forever. So Right. Well, was, I, I remember the days in the 90s they had like a bobcat um, when I was a kid going to games, and it's like it's not there's no correlation to the university at all, at least not that I'm aware of, um, and, and so that was strange. And, I mean, obviously they had to move away from – any Native American depictions and stuff like that with um, everything going on. But yeah, Kaboom's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. But just be thankful, Bobby, that they didn't implement the flying squirrel. <laughs> a lot of people, <laughs> for one of the Peoria team's mascots, it's been a push for the flying squirrels. Though. Oh, my God. I mean, you know? I remember, uh, yeah. I remember the whole time as a student, they were, asking, they were pulling us for years. Yeah. You know? So I totally. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So, you know, you uh, looked like you had you were in at Arch Madness in St. Louis for the entirety of the tournament, right? Yep. And and so it seemed like it was a great experience. I did see that you got to participate in like one of the timeout shooting contests. Yeah. Um, another That's thing I, I loved about that, right? It wasn't the uh, Evansville and ISU game, right? 
Yep. So yep, I believe, and you had the uh, Evansville shirt on to troll <laughs> our friends down the road and yep. uh, normal, and uh, and you made all three, right? Yeah. yeah. I met. I mean, yeah, I won. I didn't make all three in a row, but I, I mean, I made all three. I think it was like three for four, three for five. I was uh, having a lot of fun during the day, as you can imagine. So uh, when that game rolled around, I bought that shirt on Amazon. My cousin is a huge Evansville Aces fan, so I bought that shirt for him, and I brought it down to St. Louis once, you know, once I was going to wear it during the Evansville game, no matter what, but when they were playing Illinois State, I was like, okay, this is like perfect. So I had my Bradley hat on and my Evansville <laughs> t-shirt on to troll him. And then randomly, because, I mean, obviously that game Thursday night, decent crowd, but I mean, you know, obviously could have been better. I was probably, I was front row wearing an Evansville shirt. She's like, hey, do you want to be in the competition? I go, I looked down, I was like, oh yeah, I'm wearing this shirt. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, sure, why not? So it was fun. And I, I won this hat. That's, that's what I won was the Valley hat. <laughs> I, I was wondering what, what the prize was going to be, you know, that yeah. was awesome. And, uh, yeah. And I mean, you had from because you were on TV all the time because you had great seats right yep. behind the scores table. And I specifically remember in the semifinal game when they went over to for a monitor review yeah. late in the game, <laughs> and and you and your majestic lip sweater looked like they yeah. were trying to influence uh, the officials a little bit there, which I just thought was fantastic. And um, but yeah, if you want to kind of, I'd love to hear about your experience at Arch Madness and kind of all the things you took in and then kind of anything maybe that stood out to you uh, throughout the weekend. Yeah. So first things first, I love Arch Madness. I've been going, I think this is my sixth, sixth or seventh time going. I went a couple of times as a student, took a couple of years off. And now I go with uh, a couple of my older fraternity brothers. And I actually had my bachelor party down there last year with a bunch of my, fr my friends. Um, so it's been awesome. Um, those seats are incredible. Um, we have my, one of my, again, one of my older fraternity brothers has the hookup. So how could I deny those seats? They're fantastic. And every year um, they usually sit right behind, uh, you know, the scores table, right? So this year they're right behind the review monitor and that was fantastic. But yeah, I mean, you know, like every year, it's just fun, fun to watch every single Valley game. I mean, like you said earlier, it's just, it is quality division one basketball. I mean, everywhere you go, I, um, even on Thursday, you had some great, you know, great matchups between, I mean, the Evansville ISU game was good. The Missouri state, Murray state was good. So and then obviously as you move towards the weekend, once you get to Friday, you get to a little bit more higher seats, higher, even more high quality. And I thought all those games are fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to UIC just down the road for me right here. Thank you for winning out there. Make it, making Friday a little bit easier on us Bradley fans. Um, they put up a, a hell of a fight surprise. They fired their coach, but uh, yeah, they, Bradley, I thought overall, did, overall, obviously Saturday's disappointing, but I thought, you know, they showed up. They showed up to play. We got off to fast starts, which, I mean, we, I mean, listening to you guys, like that was a probably all February. That was probably our biggest struggle in the first half, right? So, um, but yeah, Arch Madness is awesome. I can't wait to go back. Yeah, uh, you didn't talk about. Uh, I just want to real quickly talk about Saturday's game against Drake. Yeah, um, let's give a shout out to our third team all-conference player, uh, Connor Hickman. The only other team left that had a player, I mean, you had two from Indiana State and two from Drake, and then we had Connor Hickman make all-tournament all, comp or all -tournament team. And just go quickly, 57 minutes in two games, 15 to 27 shooting, he'll go 9-16 from, from three-point land at, you know, 56% on both. Now, he didn't get to the free throw line, but four times, you know, blame that on the uh, Valley officials. <laughs> you know, every, I don't know how you can drive to the basket as much as he does, gets pushed off his line and nothing called, but that's for another day. But uh, 41 total points. So yeah. kudos to Connor Hickman. Completely, completely agree. And I told you guys before the show, I thought those are probably his two best games as a Brave. I mean, yeah. not that he's been bad really ever. Um, but I thought just consistency, uh, field goal percentage, but he was I mean, he was lights out basically. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was great to see. Yeah. And what a time to have those two games. Right. And yeah. cause we needed it. And we, we talked, uh, the last show before the tournament started about how we needed, you know, at least two of our main contributors to show up each game to, uh, to get it done. And, and I could say that I, I really think that even in the Drake game where we came up short, I don't know that we could have played much better than we played. And I know that there were some mistakes and especially 
you know, there at the end of the game. But we held their two top scorers, their two best players, I'll say. I don't know necessarily top scorers, two best players at 21 points um, between DeVries and Brody. And I, I think it was 10 or 12 minutes into the game before DeVries even scored. And we kind of speculated would the Braves come out and continue to play like team defense as they've traditionally done, or would is this a time where you'd see them lock Mal down on DeVries? And that's what they did. And they subbed him out when uh, when Tucker got subbed out. And it, it seemed to work great. Now, maybe it, it took away it took away Mal on the offensive end, uh, which probably hurt a little bit. But we had other guys pick up the slack, got off to that fast start, like you said. And, you know, I guess the maybe the difference, if you want to just generalize it, is, you know, letting them go on that run to get back in the game. Uh, before that, you know, before the end of the first half, and and from there, you know, it was just a battle the rest of the way, and despite some of the mistakes that were made, I mean, we had two or three looks in the last couple minutes to tie or take the lead, and you know, they just didn't go down, and that those are the breaks, and that's what happens. I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a problem saying that you know, the better team won that day. I mean, yeah. the you know, and they're, Drake's really really good, and um, you know, we went out and gave it everything we had, and and I thought. You know, there's there's nothing to hang your head about as a fan or as a player about that game, other than the fact that you know we we came up short of the goal, right, to uh, win an Arch Madness championship and get to the NCAA tournament. But other than that, I mean, we did everything we could have done to put ourselves in, in a position to um, to get that win, and it just you know didn't work out that way. Um, curious, kind of what your thoughts are on that game in particular uh, before we start talking about the season more in general. Yeah, completely agree. I mean. Just being right there, basically, I mean, courtside, those guys gave it their all. And I've watched every single game this year. I thought it was our, to be honest, probably outside of, like, Utah State, that game. But, like, that was our best effort by far, up and down the hole. I mean, obviously, there's going to be runs in college basketball. And when we were up, I think, 12 at one point in the first half, I, you know, people are texting me, oh, you're on TV. I was texting back. I was like, this game's far from over. Like, you know, we're not going to – Drake's going to make a run. They did. And I completely agree. I think at the end of the day, Drake's just – Drake just had the horses again. Um, not saying that our guys, they could have won that game. You know, we played it again today. Um, but let's just, I want to also give a shout out to Al, Elmar Atlison. I mean, I thought he contributed great minutes and even uh, Birch on Friday more so. But Birch coming in on Saturday because we got into some weird foul trouble too on Saturday. It felt like, I mean, um, you know, I don't think, I don't want to blame. I'll never blame the officials for really a loss like that, but it just seemed like a little more ticky tech fouls were called on Saturday. Kind of got a couple of our guys into some foul trouble. And we, I mean, I think coach said in the post game that we're playing with lineup, a lineup, a couple lineups out there that we're probably not used to. And guys responded. I mean, our bench, you know, we, we asked everything. Like if we were to say like, Hey, our bench was going to score. I, I, I don't know if you have the stat, but bench is going to score X amount of points between CDL and Demarion we would have taken that all day. So, and I think they showed up and I just, yeah, that's my thoughts from the game. Yeah. What's to me, what's been, you know, very visible if you really pay attention. And one thing with the Wardle coach team is defense, the progress that both Al and the Marion Birch, you know, accomplished through the year from when they first came in and we saw them to, and now I even mentioned to Brad, you know, about Birch. I mean, there was a time it seemed like most of the season he was just getting burnt, you know, on someone driving to the basket, you know, just getting blown right by. Yeah. And, oh, this weekend, both games, I mean, it, it was like a very conscious effort on his part to not let that happen. You know, I mean, he his footwork was so much better, got more in front of, the guy driving to the to the hoop basically changed changed that guy's course yeah. without fouling, you know. And I thought that was such a you know a very telling sign in the progress that he has made. And Atlas in the same way. And I think so much with Atlas in that it may have affected his shooting a little, but uh, he can get that back. You know, I expect him next year to come in, and you know, hopefully we have everybody come back. But that's yeah. a story for another day as well. Yeah. But uh, you know, because we'll be right back in it. If everybody comes back, there's no question with who we got already got committed to come in and then yep. some speculation on who will. So 
And I think a lot of credit goes to the coaching staff for getting those guys, you yes. know, the improvement that happened on defense. And and with me not being, uh, you know, super well versed in the, you know, s- schematics and whatnot of uh, fundamentals of basketball, especially defensively, I-, I have to assume kind of, especially on Demarion's uh, side of things, it was probably just improving his discipline. Um, he in, in high school, I imagine he was probably able to get in people's face and disrupt them and uh, create turnovers. And here, these guys, you know, they're better. And you know, he had to learn how to play a little bit more disciplined on defense and not probably over overreact to different moves and uh, ball fakes and things of that sort. And it seemed like he really improved at that. And I do think early in the season too, he was he'd make a mistake on the offensive end and try to make up for it on the defensive end. And would would lead to to fouls and things like that. Just just him trying to you know do a little too much sometimes. And you know credit to those guys and especially Al. I mean to get some of these bigs in the valley. You know like the Brodies of the world. These guys for him to get in there and and just give the effort uh, says a lot about the kind of guy he is. Uh, being physically outmatched most nights. Um, you know against some of these dudes. So no credit to those guys for sure. And you know you you couldn't ask more out of the bench than what we got over the weekend. And so we're definitely happy about that. But, you know, Arch Madness is behind us. And, you know, like we said at the beginning, Drake uh, Drake won the tournament, got the auto bid, knocking off Indiana State. And, you know, at the beginning of that game early on, I was really I was really kind of, uh, I don't know, kicking myself about, about you know, losing the game on Saturday. Because I'm like, man, Indiana State is right for the picking of the day. You know, they're gassed, whatever. You know, because Drake, you know, got out to a, a fast start and it looked like maybe – uh, the trees didn't have anything left, and I was like, "Gosh, if we could have got here, man, that could—I mean, we could have done the same thing to to them." And then they came roaring back and made it a great, a great game. It was a lot of fun to watch. And um, and if you have anything to say about that game, you can. And then I'd like you to go in just kind of on your overall feelings on the season, um, kind of the outlook you have on some of the players, coaches, and the hope for the future. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, the championship game was a classic. That was that was awesome. Um, I know Drake got up early, but I always said with Indiana State, they just chuck threes, right? I mean, they're like, well, the top top ten three point attempt teams in the country. So I was like, all right, well, they're going to keep shooting, and uh, some of these are going to fall in because they shot atrocious in the first half. So <laughs> I was like, they, what goes around comes around, and they came back, and you know, Drake, to their credit, you know, from being front row, I saw a lot of like. The veterans, Andre Tucker, Brody, even Brody, even though, you know, Saturday we got kind of got in his head a little bit. But Sunday, man, he was locked in, you know, kind of telling the other guys like Enright, the other tall uh, center that they got their backs up, Brody. But, Ferguson, you know, maybe? Yeah, Ferguson, yeah. Just like, hey, guys, let's just calm down. They're going to make the, like, a lot of this, a lot of just like, hey, let's calm down. Let's be smart with the ball. And I was like, wow, that's veteran leadership. I was like, I think Drake's going to, you know, I think Indiana State, tied even too but i was like i think drake's gonna pull it out just because of that so yeah that was that those are my thoughts on that game and i it better be too bid valley i don't i don't see how you leave indiana state out i i really don't no i don't either and and i know yeah. that that necessarily you can't you can't sit there and say that um you know because people talk about turn your phone off man <laughs> people talk about uh the um the schedule, right? Their non-con schedule. Well, man, they went to Arkansas. They went to Michigan State. Um, yeah. Or maybe it was Alabama, not Arkansas. I don't know if they – and anyhow, and they played without Avila um, in one of their games, and and they were still competitive. But the thing is, is like you can't get a home game against these guys at, at the Valley level. They won't come play you. They don't even want to play you at their place most of the time, yeah. um, you know, because they know that they are um, – that there's a, a risk, a decent chance, a fair chance that it's it could be a loss against some of these top level valley teams and mid majors in general, and so I don't know how you can. I mean, they did everything that I thought they needed to do to set their schedule up, and then just their performance throughout the season. And I, the, you know, the valley was the ninth ranked conference throughout the year, and you know, yeah, you could say, well, there's a lack of quad one wins. You know, their only quad one win was in Peoria against Bradley, but beyond that. It's a really good basketball team, and they, they kind of, uh, kind of like team. You know, they kind of hacked the net, right? They realized, you know, this is what moves the metric. They did those things at a high level, and 
I, I guess maybe the Valley could, uh, hopefully the Valley doesn't set the, the next record of having the highest ranked team and whatever the NCAA's chosen metric is that gets left out because that's yeah. really unfortunate because I think that um, both Indiana State and Drake could, can win some ball games in the tournament. There's no doubt about that. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I just think it's kind of, I mean, until we didn't all know the power six in college basketball with the TV deals and all that runs the show, but like you were alluding to, how can these power six just set up easy non-conferences because they know that they're going to set up, you know, they have the horses in their conference play, but there's, there's what I'm trying to say is that there should be a regulation for those guys to at least play like a mid-major or something in their non-conference drop down. And because there's nothing, because they don't have to schedule us and we're yeah. fighting like hell to try to get these games. I mean, yeah, Utah state was a great win, but like, I mean, what are they mountain West, right? Like, Come on, then we got to go in these tournaments. So it's a lot harder. They make it a lot harder. They always have for mid majors, and it's very you know to me for especially for non conference, it's it's frustrating. Well, my opinion is you know with the portal, like it is the transfer portals, it's leveling the field, mm-hmm. and and they're going to do something about it. The bigger conferences, they will do something about it when the mid majors get in here and start knocking off these teams. Because I think if you ask me, some of the bigger conferences this year. They're down. Yeah. I think in, in their overall just quality of basketball, yep. you know, is this down? Look at the ACC. Yeah. You know, I might pick two teams to go. I mean, if I'm picking, I might pick two teams out of that conference to go to, yep. the, to the tournament. But, you know, they're going to get five, six. Yeah. And, and based off of based off of their notoriety, the, oh. the history from years gone by, you know, sure. nothing about what's going on today the quality of their basketball today. Now, yes, okay, they're, before somebody gets me wrong, and yeah, the, you know, the Dukes and North Carolina, is, they are a little bit above. But, hey, Northern Iowa had North or, yeah, North Carolina on the ropes at halftime yep. before they came out and, you know, got their butts chewed at halftime, came out and decided to play, try to play some basketball yeah, and end up beating North, Northern Iowa. So, I mean, we can compete, play against these guys. You know, anywhere, anytime. But they, yeah. like I said, they won't come. Yeah. They won't come to our place. And, the, you know, like a team like a Bradley, if everybody stayed, and, you know, they won't they, they won't welcome them to their place next year either. Yeah. It, and, I, I mean, it seems like the only chance you get most of the time is those non-exempt tournaments. You, you hope you catch uh, catch one of those teams in the field at one, at one of those places. And uh, and what and I think my dad's got a little bit of a breakdown of it here. But, um, you know, what our tournament, the uh, SoCal challenge or whatever it was uh, looked really good. I thought uh, going into the season and then like now looking back at it, I think I'll let you go over the numbers, but like the, the net of the teams that were participating are, are not impressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Hey, I, you look at, there's three teams associated with Southern Cal. There's the Tarleton yeah. state that we played at home. Yeah. Okay. Believe it or not, they were the best of the three. That's crazy. You know, twenty three and eight. Now, grand. Okay, their net was one thirty seven. UTEP's or uh, Tulane's was is one thirty four. But what a disappointment UTEP and Tulane were. Yep. We were expecting both those. Even I even took a note for California. Yes. They happened to be better than than all them, but not much. A one twenty nine net. They're thirteen and nineteen in the Pac twelve. Yeah. Eighth. You know, Tulane is 14 and 16, 10th in the AAC. Mm-hmm. UTEP 16, 15 for what is it, sixth or fifth in the Conference USA. And, you know, we won that. And we were going in there. I said, oh, man, you know, what a tournament. We won it. We were uh, we were so excited to win that surfboard. Now you get looking, at, you know, go back at it. They were <laughs> some of the worst teams we played outside the Tarleton State. Yeah, which is that if you would have told me that today without reading those numbers, I would have been like, oh, no way. It had to be Cal. Or, you know, to, yeah, yeah. I'm not Tarleton State. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That just shows how hard it is, man, for these coaches yeah. to schedule um, yeah. in the non-conference because you obviously you're not a – you don't have a crystal ball, so you're not going to see how these teams are ultimately going to pan out. You know, you're – you're kind of obviously looking at the roster and ob- how they performed last season and, and making your own projections – and I know that you know Wardle said many times that they make an effort to you know schedule teams that they think are going to finish uh, at, at the top of their their leagues, you know. And if you can get teams like that that are mid major programs, that is that's great for the net. And and even despite some of this, I think you know we did benefit from 
obviously Utah State being a big one, but you know, I think Vermont had a, a solid season yep. um, as well. You know, so there's some others in there that definitely helped move the needle. And you know, we're a we are that stretch without Connor Hickman, the Cleveland Cleveland State, Duquesne, Akron. Like we're those those three games away from like maybe having a different conversation today about what uh, what's going to happen on Sunday. And I mean, of course, you you, you probably can't drop the Evansville and Murray State games on the road, but if you wanted to be in that conversation. But, I mean, we were right there. This, even with some of those numbers being as unimpressive as they are, I think the schedule was uh, set up at, with the team that we had to put ourselves in position, uh, even for an at-large, had we not um, won the tournament. Uh, just, you know, we didn't get the wins we needed to get. But uh, moving forward, we just talked about the postseason a little bit. So, obviously, the Braves are in strong consideration for a bid in the NIT it seems like um, it's it's more than likely at this point in time. We'll find out, I believe, Sunday night after they announced the NCAA field. And it seems the most recent thing I saw from, uh, I believe, Tony Segetti did a little digging into this, and it looks like he's – a lot of outlets are projecting the Braves heading to Iowa City to take on the Hawkeyes in the first round of the NIT. Um, that's really great for folks in Peoria because it's a, it's a really manageable, easy drive um, to get there and – you hope it's a winnable game, right? I mean, I think with this club, it should be. I do think that we're maybe, um, you know, last year, I think we really kind of, uh, we ran out of gas, man. After winning the regular season at home, we really kind of were running on fumes through the conference tournament and kind of almost, I don't say limped into the NIT, but we were not, I don't think, um, at full strength mentally or physically at that point in time. And so I'm hopeful that maybe we see a, a little different approach this time around, which I think we will. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity. And I'm curious if you've heard anything else interesting about Bradley's NIT prospects and how you feel about it in general. Um, yeah, the only other one I saw, I think the star like had a projection of like Syracuse or something, but the one not big one I'm seeing is Iowa. And while we've been doing this, Loyola lost their uh, A10 game. So they're probably going to be that's, going to that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of hurts. <laughs> They're probably going to be going to the uh, NIT as well. Um, but anyway, no, I mean, I just hope the guys are, I mean, I just hope the guys are motivated, right? I, you know, it's, it's still for us fans, still fun to watch. I mean, obviously the Wisconsin trip wasn't, didn't go as planned as last year. And I completely agree. I thought we were out of gas and um, it'd be great. It's always just fun to watch getting into the postseason. Like, you know, we can't take these years for granted at all. Like nope. or dark times and, you know, right behind, you know, oh geez, head you got the and I want another year added to that NIT banner right, right, right behind them. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be good. I just hope I hope the guys are motivated and they just make it a good game and they're you know mentally and physically locked in because it, I can totally see now, especially with NIL transfer portal, they're probably got guys talking to them this week. I hope that you know they just kind of stay locked in and be like, hey, we got another game to focus on. Season's not yeah. over. Yeah. If they have the vision that, I mean, I see them at for next year. I mean, man, yeah. I'd hate, I mean, everybody talks about, you know, you know you're an idiot if you hate, if you want to play Bradley and <laughs> NBC tournament or what, you know, I'm like, man, people, you know, we'll, we'll be a tough team to beat. I really, really believe that even with the loss of mile. Well, and I think as long as, as long as Brian Wardle's here. Um, so there we go. There's another. We got one there. Richmond lost in the A10 too, so there's another NIT bid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting, you know, what shakes out over the all the other conference tournaments this weekend, and I mean, how that dictates Bradley's chances as well as Indiana State's chances to make uh, make the NCAA tournament. Um, and, and I think another interesting thing when it comes to the NIT is you never know how locked in that power five, power six teams going to be, you know, if they even want to be there. Now, maybe that's part of the reason they made some of the changes they made to the NIT format is because now you are, you're going to see a lot more um, big time names, uh, at least recognizable. Doesn't necessarily mean they're good at basketball, but uh, at least recognizable brands in the NIT because you're going to get the two highest ranked um, teams from the power six that aren't in the NCAA tournament guaranteed as opposed to getting the these regular season champs um, getting the auto bid. Yeah. So maybe, maybe playing, playing more recognizable teams or whatever, it helps keep people locked in a little more, which just seems silly. You think if you're a competitor, you think you just want to compete, man. And, and if you have a chance to win a championship of any kind, 
you'd hope you're motivated to do that. So I'm excited for the Braves to have the opportunity. And I do think that as long as Brian Wardle's here, man, like even if we have some roster turnover, which I'm sure we will to some degree, you got to feel good about where the program's headed. I, you know, I think the culture and the system is in place. And and even if you know there's he gets an opportunity elsewhere, moves on at some point in time, um, he he would certainly be leaving the program in a much better place than he found it, and that's all you could ask um, of a coach in that situation. So feeling good about the Braves moving forward, and there is something I want to share, and I know he's in the chat, and I don't know if he's still in here, but Dave, be you, Dave, Dave Weebler, Dave, if I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly, I apologize, but uh, we did reach out to everyone on X and saying, you know, if you wanted to hop on the show, we had a couple other people interested that had some scheduling conflicts. And then uh, Dave sent uh, Matty Ice some, uh, a couple pages of bullet points about each player and kind of some some funny personal notes from the weekend. And uh, Dave, I want you to know that uh, we talked, I think we're going to do like a standalone video uh, that's going to c- contain like your bullet points about each player. Uh, because I think there's a lot of decent stuff there that kind of deserves nice. its own little uh, own conversation. But I do want to, I, I I am going to talk about your uh, your kind of overall summary and then your funny stories uh, from the weekend at Arch Madness. So you did say that uh, watching the culture and leadership on this team, uh, they hold themselves to a very high standard, uh, top to bottom. The team staff: Brian Wardle, Jimmy Foster, Mike Garden, Mike Bargan, Mike Black, Pat Altoff. Chris Braun, uh, Daryl Brown, or DB Cinco, as you call him, creating a culture that lays uh, the groundwork to make these guys respectful, mature, and good overall people, and also ballers. And I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's really when you're in the, especially, you know, obviously at the pro level, things change a lot. And with the NIL, the college landscape's changing. But I think when you are dealing with young people who are not professionals, whether it's college level, high school level, or below, your first task is to produce good human beings and to instill those traits, you know, those character traits that are going to make you successful in life because there's no guarantee, you know, at that point in time that you're going to go pro and make a living playing whatever sport it is, but you're going to be a father someday, most likely and a husband someday, most likely. And those to do those things, well, they require certain, certain traits and qualities. And I think that you kind of have a responsibility as a coach to, and you know to help instill and build those things and lead by example and i think that our coaching staff does that um as as well as anybody and that's something no matter what happens on the floor that's something i think all of us as fans can be extremely proud of um when it comes to bradley basketball for sure he holds uh he holds players accountable every year they don't buy into the culture in that type of way right i mean yeah we you know the graphic and you know we don't like that red graphic it comes up this person's been dismiss or decided to leave so he doesn't just they don't just talk it they they hold people accountable which is awesome yeah it and it it, it makes people uh it makes people uncomfortable sometimes i think and there's there's certainly people out there that have been critical of it at times but you can't argue with the results and not just the results on the floor but by all accounts you know from what you see and i understand that maybe what you see um doesn't always paint the full picture but from the public perception of a lot of these guys and and kind of stories I've heard from people that are a little closer to the program and things like that. These guys are great people uh, that really care about each other. And there there's not um, you don't have sort of the prima donna uh, ego maniacs that maybe you see at some uh, some other schools, I guess. And, you know, and that's a credit to the culture that the staff has built. And, and you know what, if that leads to maybe a few guys deciding this isn't a good fit for them. And so be it, because more often than not, if you don't have the necessary character traits, you're going to you're going to cause more problems than you're going to solve over the long run. And so the sooner you can remove that problem, the better, probably in most cases. So Dave's got some uh, personal accolades of the season, and uh, I do want to go through them uh, here real quick. So one was not passing out while yelling at games, which is uh, definitely an accomplishment. You traveled to Akron twice for Illinois State and for Illinois State the first time and then the Bradley game. Um, after the Vermont game, it felt like we were unbeatable. Peoria is on fire when these guys are winning, and that's absolutely true. And and I know that feeling. You know, I felt like there were several moments this year where you kind of got that feeling after a game. You know, kn- knowing we beat a good opponent and we played well, and just being able to see the potential for this team to be really special. And and that's that's still not over yet. Uh, there's there's still potential. There's team to go on a great run in the NIT. 
And uh, so I think that's a great point. And then you had uh, your personal embarrassments of the season. And that is that you got so drunk that you asked Almar what language that uh, they speak in Iceland. Um, <laughs> so, and then, you know, it's ice, it's, it's Icelandic jackass you put. Um, and then uh, moving on, you, uh, oh, another one you put, not getting kicked out of a single arena this season, which is an accomplishment. I don't know if that's been something that, that you've struggled with um, in the past or not. Perhaps at some point you can elaborate. And then uh, not leaving a fallen soldier behind at Ballpark Village, which is uh, <laughs> yeah. is commendable. So we uh, we uh, we appreciate that on behalf of of this uh, of this soldier that may have been left behind without you. So um, you wish Malavai, Leon's Darius, Hannah, Connor, Linky, Go and Arbil, you the absolute uh, best future. Peoria will always have a spot for you. Couldn't agree more. And the sun is setting on the second consecutive twenty two win season. Overall, so many moments this year that made it special. Um, it's one of those seasons that I didn't want to end. We are probable to get an NIT game, and I pray it's within proximity proximity for me to go. Uh, nowhere I'd rather be than supporting these guys, this team, and this school. Now let's go win the NIT charge on Bradley. Um, great words from Dave. And like I said, he had a lot of uh, really good words and points about each player that I think like I said, I think we're going to put those in like a standalone video um, to go through it. And maybe, Dave, we, maybe we may even get you to come on here and uh, go over them yourself uh, at some point in time here over the next couple of weeks. But, yeah, those are great points, Dave. And I think that most Bradley fans would agree with all those sentiments and uh, definitely a lot of positivity uh, looking, you know, looking forward into the postseason and into the future. Definitely. When you take the take the emotion, step back out of it and just look at, look around and look what it's what it's been for the last seven years it's been fantastic absolutely fantastic so that was awesome yeah no they, that was great thank you for that and again i encourage any of you at any point in time uh, if you've got thoughts uh you can send them to the number that's at the bottom of the screen 703-718-6314 you have the ability to leave a voicemail or you can send text messages um, or whatever you need to do you can uh, email the show and of course i don't have the fancy banner behind me but um, you know, it's the Matty Ice Media Network uh, on X or on X, Iceman and Coach, TikTok, I INC Sports, Facebook, INC Sports, and then of course the uh, Matty Ice Media Network, where you guys can find um, shows. There's a show there called Political Football, which is some guys that talk a lot of NFL, and then Matty Ice obviously does his Fire Footwear show for those of you who are in the sneaker world, which is uh, really interesting. Um, so before we go, Dad, you got anything you want to, any thoughts you want to leave us with before we? let Bobby go on his way? No, I mean, outside of just anticipating where we're going to play in the NIT and when. Yeah, I think that's what stinks. <laughs> if it's a Wednesday night game, I'm going to be in Charlotte um, getting ready to watch the first couple of rounds of the NCAA tournament. I'm flying out <laughs> Wednesday morning. To, I'm meeting uh, meeting Matty Ice there nice. um, to take it in. And um, so looking forward to that. But Bobby, man, um, couldn't thank you enough for joining us. Really appreciate your perspective and insight, uh, hashing through your experience at, uh, at Arch Madness. Obviously, the the fact that you were the first and original Kaboom is absolutely <laughs> legendary. Um, but I, this, I'll give you this opportunity here, man. Any final thoughts you have um, that, you, that you'd like to share? No. Well, first of all, thank you, guys. Um, and thank you for doing this. Uh, glad that you know gives us something else to uh, listen to that's kind of solely bradley and um so yeah really appreciate you guys putting this together i know it kind of started late but i'm excited for for its future and you gotta for sure have a listener so but no thanks thanks for having me on and uh you know willing to come on anytime or whatever whatever you guys decide but in regards to bradley basketball love it um very passionate uh we have a bright future always stay positive as you know Brian Wardle's got this thing going in the right direction. Hopefully, hopefully he sticks around for a long time. And uh, yeah, let's go win the damn NIT. Hell yeah, be you, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> heck yeah, man. And uh, you know that it's it's something that's been uh, you know it's Bradley basketball has been there before. You know it's it's not uh, unlike us to go on a run. And uh, what you got there? I witnessed one oh, NIT yeah. championship against Purdue. That's nice. awesome. So. Um, yeah, again, Bobby, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who tuned in or anyone that's listening to this later. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. We're super happy uh, that we're able to to put all this together and 
share all this with you and, and share in this wonderful basketball program together. And yeah, you know, we started late this season, but we've got a whole off season ahead of us where I think we're going to be able to talk about recruiting and obviously roster shakeup as it transpires. Uh, looking forward to the non-conference schedule. Uh, we can maybe get some people on here and talk about a little Bradley history and, and their own personal stories. Maybe we can find somebody a little older than even the OG to get on here and, and talk about uh, some of the glory days and What's that? Yeah, if there's anybody out there, any any listeners who actually has even more info on recruiting, you know, or possible recruits, people that uh, have uh, offers have been extended to, hey, give us give us a, uh, you know, send us a message. Love to talk to you, you know, and uh, maybe we can bring you on and let's get some more insight because that's something I I try and follow, see what everybody you know might be hearing, and go from there. For sure. And like, I mean, th- we're fans, so we're going to approach it from a fan perspective. But obviously, you know, those of you that maybe are a little more in the know, um, we don't expect you to disclose any information you may be privy to that the public's not ready for or that the, the program doesn't want out there. We're not looking for any of that stuff. Uh, I'm not looking to break any news here by any stretch. But, um, you know, definitely if there's things that are open for fair speculation, we're here for it. And yeah, uh, that being said, I want to thank you all again. Make sure, uh, like I said, like and subscribe on youtube and all the other social media places those of you that are here have been here a million times so uh thanks everybody thanks again bobby and we really appreciate everything and i hope you guys have a wonderful evening and this was braves talk Opinions and viewpoints expressed on INC Sports are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. INC Sports is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.